Hello, this is Jim Carpen. I have Mark Spock with me. Mark, how are you today? Hey, good morning, Jim. How are you today? All is well, thank you. You know, we're we're a couple weeks into this uh, COVID crisis at this point in time. You and I recently talked about the working remotely and the ideas and strategies from a security perspective. But also is what we're finding is a lot of people are vulnerable and unfortunately the scammers are out there and they're taking advantage of this situation. So people are running into having unfortunate incidents happen. So today let's talk about an incident response and what are the strategies that are out there. So what, what's your first thought on setting up an incident response and what should you be doing? So uh, I'll tell you, uh, this is becoming a, a very key point uh, for many businesses. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'll, I'll just share just a quick example of a, a recent organization that just got hit uh, with a ransomware attack. And unfortunately, this company uh, did not have an incident response plan in place. And so uh, as you can imagine, when you find yourself in the middle of a ransomware incident, uh, not too sure what steps you need to take and what your action plans are, it introduces a lot of stress. And it makes things very, very difficult as far as knowing what should I do next to get my business back up and running. So, um, you know, our government knows this, they understand that. Uh, they issued a, uh, a publication called uh, 800-61. Uh, this is from the National Institutes of Standards and Technology. Uh, in this publication, the real uh, point of this publication is to give businesses a framework that they can follow to build an incident response plan. And so it is called the Computer Security Incident Handling Guide. If you go out to nist.gov, uh, you can look for 800-61. You'll find that document and it begins to lay out the foundation and the framework for how you can build an incident response plan for your business. So Mark, based on uh, that experience that you have for the client, what would be the first step if you want to set up an incident response plan that you can take? You bet. I, I really think the first one straight out of the gate is really re reviewing your business operations and beginning to understand your infrastructure, uh, the technologies that you use to run your business, uh, understanding uh, the different components that make up your infrastructure, and identifying the key points that you need to protect. So it could be something as simple as understanding your network. It could be something as simple as understanding your VPN connections, your site-to-site -site connections, your topology. Uh, maybe you have other third-party vendors that are involved in delivering some of those services. And it's really understanding um, the weak points within that infrastructure. So as we begin to look at all the different things that make up our business and how we run our business, we can begin to look at what are the weak points within that infrastructure and what are the plans that we need to put in place should a failure occur. Uh, those plans may include additional protections or backup methodologies to make sure that we're well protected. Okay. So it sounds like, uh, from an operational perspective, you need to understand your operations. And then secondly, then start almost like a risk assessment and start thinking, what are the potential issues that can happen and potential countermeasures associated with it? So that's correct. And this phase to some degree does act as somewhat of a risk management process. Mm -hmm. uh, you are going through and, and this really is an honest review of your vulnerabilities and your weak points. Um, and one of the things I'm going to say here, which might be a little bit strong is, is there really should be no ego involved in this, in this part of the process. And the main reason I say that is, uh, you know, I've got a technology background as well. I've been an administrator we work very hard to make sure that our systems are up, that they're resilient, that they're available. And we oftentimes feel like we've done the right things. We've made the right decisions for the business. Um, but sometimes we have to set that off to the side and take a holistic look at what we've done and really identify, are there weak points? Are there vulnerabilities that need to be addressed? That's a very, very critical point uh, in this phase of the process. So really in, in working through this, it's identifying any concerns that should be remediated uh, and improved to make sure that we've uh, properly mitigated those risks. Okay, so, um, so it sounds, sorry, let me just jump in here really quick. So it sounds important from a business owner's perspective that they get the honest and candid feedback is what I'm hearing you say. And, and you know, from an experience, we've got uh, Jessica Dory's team that goes out and does the IT audits all the time. And a lot of times the IT team wants things sugar-coated so it sounds like they're doing a good job. And what I'm hearing you say is, is that we really need to get to the brass tacks and really understand and put aside all those, all those things and make sure that we're really doing a good job. 
That's correct. And, and really the, the proper way to do that is to make sure that you're working with good data. So pairing yourself with uh, a firm like Raymond that can come in and give you that vulnerability assessment and really lay out a true picture of where your environment is today, that will help give you an honest look at maybe the areas that you need to focus on and where you need to shore those areas up. Uh, it's very important that we're very honest in this phase because that uh, it's kind of like that old uh, adage that we've said, garbage in, garbage out, or G-I-G-O. Mm -hmm. So if you're not willing on the front side to really take that honest look, then as you work through and build the plan, the plan is not going to accurately represent the risks in the infrastructure that you're, tr that you're trying to protect. So it's very, very important that we take a very candid and honest look in this portion of the phase. Okay. Um, now how about how about a lot of times I hear you talk about team sports and all the different aspects. What what are your thoughts on how you put this together? Yep. So you know this is going to be a very much a collaborative effort, and incident response is very much a team sport. Um, for those businesses that maybe don't have that internal team, or they don't have those internal resources, or their specialized skill sets available, uh, that's where they're going to be looking at partnering with somebody like Raymond that can come in, help them build that incident response plan understand what those procedures look like, understand what the process is for recovery, uh, and make sure that you have a nice tight synergy with those entities or those third-party providers that are gonna make sure that we're meeting the requirements to get your business back up and running. So, um, you know, depending on your geographic uh, topology of your business, maybe you have many sites, uh, maybe you have sites that are in remote areas, you may have to look at building a response team that maybe can address a certain localized area um, because it is disparate from home base or home operation. So we have to take all of those types of um, areas into account. Um, and, and again, like I said, not all team functions have to be internal. Um, but one of the other pieces that feeds into this is thinking about other leaders within the business. So as you think about what you're supporting in the business, maybe you've got HR function, you've got an accounting function, You've got an operational uh, function as well. You may have to pull some of those leaders in as well and have some of that conversation because you want to understand from their perspective what, what needs to be recovered. What does that recovery scenario look like when I'm trying to get my, get my business back up and running? Uh, what accounting sees as being very important will feed into what that incident response team needs to deliver. So it's very important that we're looking at that. And then also, uh, what are what are my service level agreements? What am I expecting of potentially that third party provider uh, on when they should be responding to my incident and how soon I can get my business operations back up and restored? Okay, so so with that, then you're kind of molding into like the metrics and setting all those different things from that perspective. Severities, metrics. What are your thoughts? Yeah, so this is a big one because really not all issues are made the same and not necessarily all issues are going to have the same severity level. And so therefore you may not uh, have the same response. So it's very important to make sure that you're identifying the severity level of the different situations that you could potentially encounter within the business, understanding how you would classify those different things, and then making sure that you've tied to that a service level agreement, especially with your internal team or those third-party providers to say, hey, if, if I find myself in a, I'll just give an example, is I'm in a SEV1 incident. I'm completely down. My operations are down. We are not able to conduct business operations. That type of a response is going to be very different than maybe if I'm dealing with a SEV3 incident, or maybe I just have a localized incident. Maybe I just have a, a group of users that are impacted or individuals that are impacted, but the, the balance of the business can continue to function and operate without any challenge. So we wanna make sure that we lay out uh, what our expectations are for the different severity levels, the types of scenarios that may fit into those severity levels, and then what our expected response time for our incident response team is gonna be for each one of those categories. Okay, so, so far we've talked about <clears throat> reviewing the operations, getting the big picture understanding some of the potential issues, then developing the metrics as well as the severity levels that you're talking about. At this point, do you start building the action plans and making sure that they're ready to go? And how do you get that accomplished? Yep, absolutely. Th that is the next step. I mean, you want to kind of take all of the information that you've learned about your operation, about your applications and your infrastructure, 
Uh, you've had some time to kind of put your incident response team together. You've thought about some of your metrics and some of the severities that may go along with that. You've identified your vulnerabilities and maybe even identified some areas where you can mitigate those controls. So now it's actually time to start building the plans of if we find ourselves in some type of a cyber incident, if we find ourselves in a ransomware attack, what are the steps that we're going to follow? And so you really wanna have those plans built uh, and they really need to be actionable and they really need to call out the roles and responsibilities for the team members that are involved in the incident response. Uh, each, each person plays a very key role in the delivery of incident response. Uh, same thing if you're doing internal team versus partnering with a vendor. The vendor is going to have a very specific set of roles and guidelines, and they're going to have action plans as well that they need to follow that tie in to the recovery of your business. So it's very important that we have that together. One thing that I would recommend uh, is that we have those action plans available maybe out in the cloud and we potentially have a paper copy of those plans. It's very important that we have those available to the teams that need them. If you do find yourself in a situation where your infrastructure is down, your company is down, and you're not able to get out to the network, or you're not able to access file shares, as is usually the case with many ransomware incidences, uh, you wanna make sure that those plans are available. So, uh, and as I like to say, make a plan and then follow the plan. Okay. So, so now another challenge is, is if you do put a plan together, how do you know if it works and, and, and how do you, how do you make sure that that actually does function? Thoughts on that? Yep. So that gets into really talking about testing and then updating our plan. So it's very, very important that we are taking the plans that we've created uh, at a minimum through a test. And we want to make sure that the plans that we've laid out are as accurate as they can possibly be. Um, the old adage says experience is the best teacher and there's just some things that you're not going to be able to replace in a testing scenario that you would gain and or learn in a real world scenario. But one of the things that I would recommend is looking at a tabletop test. You get all of the people together that are involved in your incident response. It could be your internal team. It could be a mixture of some of your vendors and partners. And you lay a scenario on the table and say, okay, guys, we're going to walk through this together. Uh, we want to understand uh, everybody's role and responsibility. How will they approach it? Um, and really talk through what those recovery plans look like and begin to understand if maybe there's some gaps that we didn't see the first time when we were putting these plans together. So it's very, very important that we're taking the opportunity to test. Uh, one of the things that you can consider doing is if you have the available infrastructure is looking at taking a copy of your production and using that in a test environment and maybe walking through some of those scenarios in a test or a lab environment, which is safer because now you're not, you're not playing around with your production data, but it kind of gives you a better sense of what potentially could happen and what those outcomes would be. So it's important that you're working through the testing as much as you can uh, so that when you do get into a real world incident, you're gonna have just a little bit more confidence in the plan that you've put together because you've exercised it a little bit. So. Uh, very important that you go through this step. And then again, on the backside, what did we learn when we did that test? Did we find things where maybe the plan did not line up or, or maybe it had some gaps? We want to shore those gaps up. We want to document that and then run it through the next scenario. Okay, great. Now, some clients have business continuity plans, they have incident response plans, they have disaster recovery plans. How do they all fit together? And what are your thoughts on that? You bet. So all of those plans really do feed into incident response. When we talk about, like, for instance, a disaster recovery plan, uh, these are the marching orders that the technical staff follow when they're dealing with a major incident to recover a system and application infrastructure and get that back up and running. So very much you're going to find that these things are going to come together. They're going to gel together into a fluid document. Um, not necessarily, depending on the scenario, will you necessarily have to engage that disaster recovery plan? It's really going to depend upon the incident that you're dealing with, but they definitely should be factored in and they should be uh, well thought out and make sure that we've covered all the different tenants of what would be required if we found ourselves in a situation where we had to follow the entirety of that disaster recovery plan. We want to make sure that we have that available to us. Additionally, uh, when we talk about like a business impact analysis, um, that also feeds into also understanding our vulnerabilities a little bit. 
So as we begin to understand our critical systems, uh, what's required to get up first? Well, that feeds into our disaster recovery plan because that's our first area of focus. Those are the critical systems that we need to get online first because they are critical to the operation of the business. It could be the accounting department, it could be the HR department, it might be production data that is being served out to our clients. So we really want to understand our business impact analysis and laying out and structuring all of our systems that feeds into our disaster recovery plan that lays out the steps of what we're going to follow to get those systems back in line. And then again, that feeds into the incident response plan and it ties it all together. Okay. So the, a lot of times, depending upon the size of the organization, there's complexity. So the left hand and the right hand need to be synchronized. What are your thoughts on business units and keeping everybody all in the same cadence? You bet. So it's important that we are pulling in other leaders within the business because um, those business managers are going to understand their operation. They're going to understand their application right down to the nuts and bolts. So when we start talking about building an incident response plan or even in that fact, uh, building a disaster recovery plan, we may need to account for very specific things that the business manager is going to understand that the technical folks may not be aware of. There could be intricacies, for example, within a database. There could be particular records within a database that are very key to that business manager's operation. And so when we're going through the restoring process, if we've not accounted for those databases or those tables, then that business manager's really been impacted and they're not really back online like we hope they would be. So it's very important that we're pulling in these other business leaders from these other functions to make sure that we've accounted for all the things that we need to cover for them to actually call our recovery a success. Okay, so so recently I think you guys have worked on like 10 uh, client incidents where you've run the ambulance, went out in the field. And so you've learned a lot of lessons as a result of that. What, what are your thoughts on leveraging what you've learned and incorporating them back into the process? You bet. Uh, this is a very key point that many of us need to make sure that we're consistently doing on a regular basis and that there's always opportunity to learn from experience. And as I mentioned earlier, experience is the greatest teacher. Um, we've done our best to try to test our disaster recovery plan and run through the different scenarios. But until you're actually walking through that live incident, um, there's just some things that you're not gonna be able to account for in your incident recovery plan. And so, uh, it's very important that we're taking, after we've walked through that live incident, that we're sitting down as a team. We're talking about what went well. We're talking about what didn't go well. We're talking about maybe where we had gaps in the plan where we just, we didn't account for something that happened in this particular scenario. How do we drive that back into our incident recovery plan? We document that, we expand it out, and then the next time we run through that test, we've now accounted for it. Or the next time we have that live scenario, we've now got it baked in. So it's very, very important that we're sharing those lessons learned, especially if we have that third-party vendor engagement. That vendor wants to deliver service for, for you, the customer. So they wanna understand from their perspective, maybe where they could have improved or maybe some different things that weren't accounted for in their plan and their portion of the recovery for your business. So it's important that we talk about that. We want to be very honest in that feedback, and we want to make sure that we're getting that looped back in to how we're structuring this plan. Yep. And so I always hear it's real important to have this all set in place before things actually happen. And from what I understand, yep. a lot of times clients aren't, they're caught off guard, which, uh, which delays the process and response. You bet. And I, you know, I shared that earlier, you know, the, the client example of a client that was hit by a ransomware attack. And, and unfortunately, you, it's hard to know when these things are going to happen. Um, uh, but unfortunately, the, the sad or sobering truth is right now is that there are two types of companies, companies that have been hacked and companies that will be. So it's very, very important that we are putting these measures in place. We're thinking ahead. Um, one of the things that you can do as a business owner or business operator uh, is you could look at incentivizing your team. Um, this is a great way to make sure that these objectives get hit. You may look to incentivize your team to make sure that we're maintaining uptime and reliability, but at the same time, we're building an incident response plan. Uh, that's a great way to encourage your technical team to make sure that they're going through this process, they're going through the testing, they're going through the development, they're identifying the vulnerabilities and the weak points within the business. And they're constantly working through that loop and that feedback process 
uh, that's a great way to make sure that your team's consistently stay engaged and you're as prepared as you can be uh, for when that incident ha uh, happens. Okay, perfect. So if uh, people have additional thoughts or questions, best way to reach you? You bet. Uh, I, I'm available. Uh, feel free to drop me an email. You can reach me at mark.spock at raymond.com. That's spelled R-E-H-M-A-N-N. -N, and then it's M-A-R-K dot S-P-A-A-K. Okay, perfect. Thanks for your time. You know, just uh, as a parting thought, uh, you, were, you were quoting Robert Miller, who is the uh, former FBI uh, head. And he said, you know, if, you, if there's two types of companies that have been hacked and will be hacked. And I heard somebody say, well, you know, there's two really two different types of companies. There's companies that have been hacked and then companies that don't know they've been hacked. So, so that's a that's another great way to put it as well, because right now the mean time average from hack to actual discovery right now is still running in about that four to six month territory. Absolutely. So anyways, uh, Raymond's here to, from a technology services perspective. If you guys do get hacked and you need help, Mark and team can come to the rescue. So Mark, thanks for your time. And we'll talk soon. Thanks, Jim. Appreciate it.